हेलो डी स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू बाजीराव आई ए एस अकेडमी द हिंदू न्यूज एनालिसिस सो टुडे इज संडे फोर्टीन जुलाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर एंड टुडे वी हैव कम अप विथ फ्यू इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स फॉर द डिस्कशन सो विदाउट एनी फर्दर डिले विल ट्राई टू डिस्कस एंड एनालाइज ऑल इंपॉर्टेंट न्यूज आर्टिकल्स वन बाय वन एंड बिफोर डिस्कसिंग दैम ट्राई टू सॉल्व एस्टेडे गिवन प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन यू ऑल न्यू दैट एस्टेडे हैव गिवन वन जियोग्राफी बेस्ड प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन सो द क्वेश्चन इज विथ रेस्पेक्ट टू द रेड सी एंड इट्स बॉर्डरिंग कंट्रीज राइट सो इफ यू लुक इन टू द रेड सी एंड इट्स लोकेशन रेड सी इज लोकेटेड इन दी मिडिल ईस्ट और वेस्ट एशिया सो द क्वेश्चन इज रेड सी इज अ स्ट्रिप ऑफ वाटर एंड इट इज एन इनलेट ऑफ द इंडियन ओशन and in fact the red sea has been occupying the area separating the continent of africa from the continent of asia the countries bordering the red sea are which of the following countries right so which of the following countries are actually sharing their borders with the red sea now you can see in the options only four countries have been sharing their borders with the red sea and we need to identify those countries which have been sharing their borders with red sea right so uh, if you look into the map of this countries which have been sharing their borders with red sea this is the location of the red sea right so it is very clear i think so this is indian ocean right indian ocean and arabian sea and then arabian sea indian ocean and this region that i am highlighting here is the uh, location of red sea so red sea through the gulf of suez opens to the mediterranean sea right so here strait of gibraltar and from strait of gibraltar it would be connected to the atlantic ocean so the region that i am highlighting here is the location of red sea in the world map and you can also see the red sea here right so now understand the countries which have been sharing their borders with the red sea now egypt clearly sharing its borders with red sea uh, sudan also sharing its borders eritrea has been sharing its borders with the uh, red sea and djibouti and even somalia also uh, to some extent uh, no we cannot uh, you know consider somalia as a country which has been sharing its borders so to some extent we can say that yes uh, somalia is also been sharing its borders with the red sea right so yemen sharing its borders and saudi arabia also sharing its borders with the red sea but uh, one thing that you need to understand ethiopia is not sharing its borders with the red sea right so you can eliminate ethiopia so option 3 you can eliminate because ethiopia clearly not sharing its borders with the red sea right so ethiopia is not sharing its borders with the red sea but remaining all other countries that were given in the option such as egypt saudi arabia yemen and djibouti so all these countries have been sharing their borders with the red sea and this is the location of red sea so i hope it is clear for all of you and today also i have a very important question so remember this question was based from the uh, previous day discussion right so uh, previous discussions so especially with respect to the demographic dividend right so when we talk about the uh, nature of this particular question in upsc prelims examination there are very often questions Uh, of this nature right so upsc very often asks questions of this nature right so this is not the definition of demographic dividend the question is not about the definition of demographic dividend but if you clearly understand the concept of demographic dividend you can answer this question correctly right the question is which of the following statements describes the term demographic dividend correctly right so there are four options option a it is a rise in the gross employment ratio of a country due to the government policies option b a rise in the standard of living of the people due to the growth of alternative livelihood practices option c a rise in the rate of economic growth due to higher share of working age population in the population in the total population and option d a rise in the rate of literacy due to development of educational institutions in different parts of the country right so this demographic dividend question is very very important and if you correct understand the meaning of this or correctly understand the concept of demographic dividend you can accurately answer this question right so try to answer this question in the comment section so we will explain uh, this a demographic dividend question tomorrow right so the first question that we are going to start this discussion is with the 
human wildlife conflict in india right so as i have already told you that india is one of the uh, rich biodiverse countries right so we also have a uh, four different biodiversity hotspots in our country right so since it is a uh, you know rich biodiverse region and due to increasing anthropogenic activities in recent times what has been happening the animals are generally venturing into the human habitations and that has been leading to the human wildlife conflict so there are number of reasons which have been increasing this human wildlife conflicts however recently kerala government has come up with a new technology to minimize the human wildlife conflicts because when we talk about the human wildlife conflicts states like chatisgarh odisha jharkhand kerala karnataka very often we have been you know listening about the human wildlife conflicts in these news however the primary reason for the human wildlife conflict is increasing anthropogenic activities right the human activities into the habitat of these wild animals is the primary cause of the human wildlife conflict now we will understand what sort of a technology kerala has been bringing in to minimize human wildlife conflict so understand the context of this particular article the context is that recently the kerala forest department has actually aimed to integrate the cutting edge technologies because it is very important that whenever we wanted to find out a sustainable solution technology could provide an appropriate and sustainable solution to that particular problem and in fact it could be a win win situation for the forest department for the people and also the animals as well so therefore the kerala forest department has been planning to integrate technology into this uh, human wildlife conflict so that could essentially prevent the increased or growing the human wildlife conflicts right so these technologies would be integrated with the existing traditional knowledge of the communities who are very often living very closely with the uh, environment and along with this technology and you know uh, the existing traditional knowledge so that can be used effectively to manage human wildlife conflicts in the state that have been taking place very frequently right so we will understand the what is the framework that the kerala forest department is going to develop to prevent human wildlife conflict right so this is very important most uh, probably this is important for your general studies paper 3 economy section right so uh, economy paper but uh, within the economy paper there is an environment section in that environment section there may be a main question with respect to the human wildlife conflict incidents and reasons and the, the mitigation measures right so when we talk about the mitigation strategies of human wildlife conflict that the kerala forest department has been looking in is that a blueprint has been provided right so this particular blueprint has ha also highlighted 17 different strategies and those 17 strategy different strategies would be implemented over a period of 3 years right so these strategies would be implemented over a period of a uh, coming 3 years so these strategies also aimed to mitigate human wildlife conflict and in fact what about the funding of these different 17 strategies the funding would be done through the central and state government allocations and the funding from the schemes like mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act can also be used in mitigating the human wildlife conflicts and apart from that these initiatives would also include artificial intelligence the potential of artificial intelligence can also be used in mitigation of human wildlife conflicts because artificial intelligence based alert systems and these alert systems which are based on the artificial intelligence can effectively provide a real time updates and they can also uh, you know these regular alerts 
would be able to prevent a large scale human wildlife conflicts now with human wildlife conflicts what has been happening either animals are being killed or human beings are injured or it also leads to the loss of property now apart from this artificial intelligence based systems they will be a thermal sensor equipped drones also to regularly make sure that there is an effective surveillance system is in place right so thermal sensor equipped drones and they will be camera traps so all these things which are essentially driven by the technology will further enhance surveillance along the forest buffers right so it is very important that we need to significantly enhance our surveillance within the forest a uh, buffer areas or the forest fringes and therefore we could substantially reduce the risk of human wildlife conflict and apart from that this particular framework of mitigating human wildlife conflict also include construction of barriers right so various barriers would be erected across these forest fringes so these barriers include both physical barriers and the biological barriers also now we will understand what are these physical barriers and biological barriers so however the master plan or the framework of mitigating this particular conflict also include a uh, barriers both physical barriers and biological barriers and these barriers actually stop the animals entering into the human habitations and then further preventing the risk of human wildlife conflict now when we talk about the biological barriers so one effective method is beehive fencing so beehive fencing is a uh, one of the very effective method that can be used as a biological barrier and in fact it was proved effective in countries like uh, in continents uh, like africa and different southeast asian countries right so these bee hives you can see on this image so these bee hives actually provides a biological barrier to animals so therefore the animals would not enter into the human habitations because it would effectively repel animals like elephants they not to venture into the agriculture fields and also the human habitations so the kerala forest department also planning to erect such biological barriers and these bee hive barriers are also known as the biofences right so they can be called as biofences and these biofences can also be erected through crops like chili so these chili crops can also be grown because those chili crops or uh, chili cropped biofences can effectively prevent elephants from entering into the human settlements now apart from that there are certain issues with respect to the human wildlife conflict so we will understand that also for example a developing infrastructure and human resources for effective mitigation of human wildlife conflict is very very important we need to develop infrastructure so when we talk about the biological barriers and the physical barriers so they include uh, you know developing infrastructure across these uh, forest areas that could prevent the entry of these animals into the human habitations and agriculture fields and in fact the kayala and elephant proof walls so these are one of the effective barriers which could prevent the entry of elephants into the human habitations and in fact it is one of the most famous walls to uh, prevent the entry of uh, uh, elephants in the state of kerala however the problem with such uh, infrastructure projects is that they involve a very high cost the implementation cost is very high it would be around a uh, 140 lakh per kilometer so that is a huge cost and at this point of time the governments cannot afford such a huge cost and therefore we need to look into the alternative methods of preventing the entry of animals into the human habitations right so as i have already told you what does this human wildlife uh, conflict exactly means now human wildlife conflict means that animals venturing out of their habitats 
and coming into the human habitations and uh, human settlements and that leads to the human wildlife conflict and this human wildlife conflict has been leading to either the death of these animals which are coming into the human habitations or the killing or injury of people and even the property is being damaged in the human habitations because of a very frequent venturing of these animals into the human habitations right so we'll understand some statistics with respect to the human wildlife conflict now when we look into the statistics the annual death toll in india because of the human animal uh, animal conflicts it would be around 400 people per annum and in fact it is also damaging thousands of crops the human wildlife conflict is also one of the reason for the damage of thousands of crops uh, you know thousands of acres of crops and in fact it also having you know unmeasured psychological stress on the affected community due to this uh, human wildlife conflict so we'll also look into some statistics with respect to this particular conflict now kerala has the forest cover of approximately 11521 square kilometers and in fact so it is extending over 29.65 percentage of the total geographical area of the state so however we look into some reasons for the increasing human wildlife conflicts in india so there are certain reasons because of these reasons human wildlife conflicts have been substantially increasing so first the changed cropping patterns is the one reason because of the changed cropping pattern the human wildlife conflicts have been substantially increasing in recent times yeah yeah sorry about that right and apart from that the modification of the forest environment also so this is another you know uh, why uh, forest environment is very often modified because see uh, most of the infrastructure projects have been passing through these uh, infrastructure projects are running through the forest for example when we talk about the railway network or even highways are also passing through uh, these uh, forest areas and that very often lead to the habitat fragmentation the fragmentation of the forest uh, habitat so when uh, the forests are being uh, fragmented these animals are very often coming out of the habitat and they are venturing into the uh, human uh, habitation so that very often lead to the human wildlife conflict and in fact there are number of reasons for the human wildlife conflict so you can clearly see that there's a national park and within this national park there's a railway lane which has been passing through and the road network which has been passing through so these animals uh, very often migrate to a larger regions for the food and various other uh, purposes right so in fact human settlements are also another major reason uh, for increasing human wildlife conflicts so human inclusion uh, incursions into the traditional migration paths of these wild animals is also another reason so that is the human inclusion of uh, into the traditional migration path so for example imagine this is a migration path of elephants right so this can be considered as a human incursions into the traditional migration path of animals and we are interfering in their migration patterns we are interfering in their uh, you know uh, the habitat of these species and that leads to the human wildlife conflict so another very important reason is habitat loss and fragmentation and even increasing the wildlife population and invasive alien species have reduced the availability of food and fodder so i will tell you one example uh, i will tell you explain this how invasive alien species because you know invasive alien species uh, very often have the damaging effect on the existing ecosystem existing flora and fauna right so they have some advantages and due to those advantages they grow much more faster than the indigenous uh, you know flora right so since they glow, grow much more faster and they also use more resources in that particular ecosystem what happens that uh, you know there will be no competition there will be high competition for one uh, for some time and in this particular competition between the indigenous species and invasive alien species 
ultimately the invasive alien species would emerge victorious because of certain advantages that they have over the indigenous uh, ecosystems and that lead to the uh, colonization of the ecosystem by the indigenous uh, you know in uh, sorry the invasive alien species and when the invasive alien species colonized all the ecosystem so earlier these animals dependent on the native flora not native plants so therefore when invasive alien species are generally not the food for these animals so therefore for the purpose of food they are venturing out of their habitat and that is also another cause of human wildlife conflict and after that even recent times a uh, monoculture of the species such as a uh, eucalyptus and acacia so these uh, species also biodiversity as well and the planted biodiversity also linked to lack of food right so if there is uh, you know less biodiversity because of these monoculture of number of species especially the invasive uh, alien species that very often lead to a lack of adequate food for these animals and therefore they are venturing into the and that lead to human wildlife conflict right so what should be the measures that have to be taken so the kerala De uh, forest department has been undertaking certain measures to reduce this human wildlife conflict and such sustainable environment friendly methods need to be followed and community should also be engaged in preventing the human wildlife conflicts however no doubt that it requires a comprehensive framework right so comprehensive framework which involves multiple stakeholders so that is how we can reduce the incidence of man human uh, animal conflicts so next important article is with respect to the growing levels of air pollution and how this air pollution has been impacting the pollinators in the ecosystem now understand pollinators such as bees play very very important role right so they play a very important ecosystem services they provide ecosystem services and these ecosystem services are very very important for the agriculture and larger food security and even the ecosystem sustenance right so this could ensure food security and agriculture production and even the ecosystem or environmental sustainability over a period of time but the problem is that there is a growing level of air pollution and that air pollution has been harming the pollinators right so as i have already told you that these pollinators provide a very very important role in a cross pollination of cross pollination of different species of plants and this cross pollination would further enhance the floral biodiversity right so biodiversity is very very important and bee uh, bees and other pollinators play a very important role in significantly improving the biodiversity of an area through the cross pollination however in recent times air pollution has been increasing at a substantially higher pace because of number of reasons for example the vehicular emissions have been one of the leading cause for the air pollution and industrial emissions also another major cause of air pollution and even the construction dust also contributes to the construction dust also contributes to the air pollution and next landfill sites are burned very often part of these landfill sites and these are the factors which have been contributing to the increasing air pollution and the increasing air pollution certainly have its impact on the pollinators which provide important ecosystem services so we will understand that in a very detailed manner right now you can see here the sources of the air pollution right so agriculture is the source of air pollution
of various species various plant species right so uh, if you understand this particular context uh, bees and other beneficial uh, insects so these uh, insects are disproportionately harmed by air pollution right so uh, you know there are number of pest species and these pest species impact or harm uh, crops right so there are number of pest species and these uh, pest species uh, harm the crops and because of that reason we use insecticides however compared to uh, these uh, you know uh, insects or pests which have been destroying the crops there are a number of beneficial insects which are harmed more by the air pollution than the crop destroying pests according to a new study so therefore this is a particularly alarming and when we talk about this according to this study 40 types of insects in 19 countries are respond to air pollutants like ozone particularly the ground level ozone is known as air pollutant ozone nitrogen oxide sulfur dioxide and even the particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter so there are two important particulate matters so particulate matter 2.5 Uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10, right? So these are the major air pollutants, and these air pollutants are harming the benefit. Or these natural pollinators, they include some bees and moths and butterflies, right? So these are important pollinators. in fact they are also the beneficial insects these uh, beneficial pollinators have been uh, you know it it is experienced that there is a 39% decline in the efficiency of these particular uh, because when uh, they are increasingly exposed to the higher levels of air pollution right so in recent times so however there are other beneficial insects also right so there are you know we talk about moths butterflies and uh, bees all these are beneficial insects such as bees wasps so these beneficial insects are a uh, more affected right so these beneficial insects are more affected due to the air pollution compared to the some other uh, insects or pests which are destroying the crops right so it would be good if air pollution actually harms the crop destroying pests but instead of harming the crop destroying pests the air pollution has been harming or affecting the beneficial insects such as bees wasps butterflies and moths so why uh, you know there is a difference how there is a differential impact of air pollution on the pests and insects it is because insects mostly rely on scent based communication right so they mostly rely on the scent based communication many beneficial insects including bees wasps moths they use this airborne chemical signals right so they very often uses the airborne chemical signals to locate flowers and find mates and hunt their prey right so because of increasing air pollution what has been happening there is a disruption in the communication of these uh, beneficial species right so that is one of the reason now air pollutants can chemically alter these scent okay so they can chemically alter these scent trails and once they alter this scent trails they can also interfere with the insects ability to detect them and essentially disrupting their sensory landscape over a period of time and in fact these pests which harm the crops which destroy the crop so they actually rely on a less long distance scent cues compared to the beneficial insects right so uh, when we talk about the pests so they also rely on communication but their communication is very short when we compare it with the 
beneficial insects because beneficial insects very often have the longer communication and increasing air pollution has been interrupting this particular longer communication of these species so that is the problem which has been affecting the ability of these pollinators to perform their ecosystem services and in fact this air pollution impacts various insect behavior and even their biological aspects also so that include their feeding patterns their growth their survival sustenance of these species and reproduction and even ability to locate the food sources now what happens over a period of time their numbers would be substantially declining because of the increase in air pollution now in this it is very important that we must understand the concept of food web and food chain so food web and food chain are the concepts based on which the entire food cycles are sustaining and depending right so therefore in this food chain <coughs> and food web so these bees and other insects play a very very important role at the primary level right so if these bees species started collapsing all other species which are dependent on these species would also collapse over a period of time and that would create a large scale of food security problem in the world over a period of time right so the global population has reached 800 crore and in this context it is very important that we need to ensure food security for all the population along with ensuring the environmental sustainability and that is why the world has been emphasizing on the sustainable development right so sustainable development is a very often a balanced development because it balances the developmental requirements with the environmental sustainability right so when we talk about all the pollutants which actually interrupt the long signal sends of these bees species so ozone plays a very important role right so in fact ozone emerged as a particularly harmful these species so you know when we talk about the uh, air pollutants there are number of air pollutants such as particulate matter 2.5 particulate matter 10 ozone especially the ground level ozone and nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide so all these are the pollutants especially the air pollutants however among these all, uh, all air pollutants ozone has emerged as a, a particularly harmful pollutant for the beneficial insects such as bees moths and butterflies etc so therefore the ozone as an air pollutant has been reducing the ability of these beneficial insects to thrive and carry out their roles in the ecosystem by at least 35 percentage and in fact the ozone pollution has a most detrimental impact and even low ozone levels below the current air quality standards can also causes a significant damage to these beneficial insect species and apart from ozone nitrogen oxides also substantially impaired the beneficial insects right so we can say that all these air pollutants one way or the other having a significant impact on the beneficial insect species and in fact it is expected that over a period of time because of the number of anthropogenic activities and increased use of fossil fuels by the human beings it is expected that over a period of time the tropical ozone concentration would be substantially increased that could result in unintended consequences to the global invertebrate populations and their valuable ecological services right so that would be the a uh, consequence of uh, you know increasing pollutants into the environment so uh, in this context what we should do to reduce the emission of uh, harmful pollutants into the atmosphere so first thing was that we must do is we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and we need to adopt renewable energy resources on a large scale so this is also very important adopting renewable energy resources on a large scale and we need to substantially reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and apart from that 
we should uh, make sure that a uh, waste management would be a uh, sustainable in nature right so recycling of the waste is a uh, very very important and landfill sites should not be burned and stubble burning should also be substantially reduced and we should emphasize on balanced development rather than blindly emphasizing on economic growth alone because emphasizing on economic growth alone would not address the existing problem so next important article is with respect to the critical minerals and india's hunt to the critical minerals now why critical minerals are very important they are very very important because of number of reasons right so one uh, important reason uh, because why india has been increasingly emphasizing on critical minerals is that you know most of these batteries are made with lithium right a lithium is also a critical mineral but for the critical mineral like lithium we have been dependent on other countries such as south uh, america such as central asia right so why don't we have a self reliance on the critical minerals so instead of depending on other countries for these critical minerals because understand critical minerals will be the future so since critical minerals is the future it is very important that we need to achieve atmanirbharata we need to achieve self reliance in the critical mineral production we should not depend on the critical minerals for other countries right so in case uh, you know uh, that can be uh, a detrimental for india's interest because other countries can use our dependence for the geopolitical reasons for example imagine that for uh, some critical minerals we have dependent on china right so china for geopolitical reasons can stop or can even threaten india uh, with supplying of these critical minerals so therefore the self reliance in critical minerals is very very important we'll understand the context of this why india has been looking for the critical minerals so recently the center has declared the bidders of mining rights in six blocks so these six blocks across different states in india are known to have critical minerals right so the bidders for exploring the critical minerals were recently declared by the central government and these critical minerals within these six blocks include critical minerals such as graphite phosphorite lithium on which for which india largely relies on the imports right so majority of the critical minerals are imported from other countries so we should not depend on other countries for the import of these critical minerals right so in fact these are the first private players to explore to mine these critical minerals under the revamped or changed mines and minerals law by the government right so why critical minerals are very very important so we will understand this right so critical minerals are important because now if you look at the top industries in india so most of these top industries such as telecommunication telecom energy defense aerospace transportation so these can be considered as a top you know industries and all these top industries are dependent on the critical minerals right so therefore in order to sustain the economic growth and economic development and boost the industrial production and productivity these critical minerals are very very important right so therefore we will understand that what is the use of this critical minerals in a detailed manner so there are some number of critical minerals such as copper can be considered as a critical mineral lithium a critical mineral nickel cobalt so all these minerals are known as critical minerals so in fact so these minerals along with some rare earth elements so they are very very important for you know uh, the world's efforts to make a transition towards a green growth or a green economy right so we all wanted to reduce our dependence on the fossil fuels now why we wanted to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels is because fossil fuels have been contributing to the climate change right so however in order to achieve that particular goal these critical minerals are very very important they play a very important role in switching over to the greener and cleaner energy over a period of time and in fact if you look at the united nations framework convention on climate change so 
so this united nations framework convention on climate change has been emphasizing that we must reduce global temperatures by 2 degrees celsius by 2100 but if it is possible we must reduce it to uh, limit it to 1.5 degrees celsius rise by 100 uh, 2100 pre industrial levels so that is the global target of a uh, climate change or global warming target however a number of countries also aimed to achieve a net zero most of the countries wanted to become net zero by 2050 but india wanted to become net zero by 2070 right so in order to become net zero by 2070 so we need to have these critical minerals and these critical minerals play a very very important role in ensuring india a net zero right so therefore the demand for these critical minerals has been substantially increasing or rapidly rising so by 2040 the demand for copper is expected to increase by 50% and the demand for nickel would double by 2040 and even uh, you know cobalt and other rare earth metals the demand would actually quadruple for graphite it would be eight fold graphite and lithium it would be an eight fold increase in the demand of these so this is how because of a huge significance for the industrial development of these particular critical minerals the demand would be expected to increase substantially over a period of time so however so when we talk about the reserves of these critical minerals in india we do not have a substantially high reserves of critical minerals we have dependent on imports for these critical minerals and therefore for several uh, critical minerals we have 100% import dependence particularly minerals like lithium cobalt and nickel and they play a very important role in manufacturing electric batteries those electric batteries are very important for the electric vehicles so we wanted to introduce electric vehicles on indian roads by 2030 so in order to achieve that goal these critical minerals are very important but on the other hand we are dependent on other countries for the import of these critical minerals and apart from that 95 percentage of india's copper requirements are also met through imports right so we have a substantially dependent on other countries for our import requirements of these critical minerals and the, the government has been planning to reduce our dependence on other countries for these critical minerals right however when we talk about uh, reserves these reserves india currently holds 11 percentage of the world's deposits of a limonite so this limonite is also one of the main source of titanium dioxide and this titanium dioxide also have a uh, several applications right so apart from that lithium reserves a recent discovery of lithium reserves in the union territory of jammu and kashmir while the geological survey of india also exploring states a terrain jammu and kashmir's terrain for limestone that has triggered the hope for some self sufficiency in the mineral production and therefore because of that reason there has been an increased emphasis on the exploration and mining of these critical minerals so that we can achieve self reliance and self sufficiency over these minerals and in fact the central government has amended the mines and minerals development and regulation act of 1957 in august 9 2023 so this particular amendment has enabled the central government to grant mining concessions for 24 critical and strategic minerals and apart from that this made in auction of critical minerals in india for three blocks in odisha and one in each state of tamil nadu up and chhattisgarh so you can go through the list of critical minerals for example lithium a critical mineral that can be used in rechargeable batteries ceramics and cobalt that can be used again in rechargeable batteries and super alloy and nickel that can be used to produce stainless steel super alloys and rechargeable batteries so all these things are very very important so you just have to go through these critical minerals 
And next important article is with respect to a recent Supreme Court ruling with respect to the portrayal of disability in films. Now, how the disability has been portrayed in films, so that turned out to be a derogatory and discriminatory for the people with disabilities. Now, we will understand. Recently, there was a movie, right? So, uh, on July 8, there was a hearing in the Supreme Court. So, with respect to a uh, you know, a petition which has been requesting the court to ban the film. So that film was Ankh uh, Micholi, right? So that was the film Ankh Micholi for the derogatory portrayal of people with the disability. So this particular film has portrayed people with disabilities in a, a very derogatory manner. However, a Supreme Court in a landmark ruling has actually laid out a comprehensive guidelines to prevent stereotyping and discrimination of persons with the disabilities in visual media, documentaries, advertisements and films. So that is the context. Now we will understand what are these comprehensive guidelines of the Supreme Court with respect to the portrayal of disability people, people with disabilities in films and documentaries and advertisements. The Supreme Court has clearly laid out that there should be a prevention of stigmatization and discrimination and in fact, the people who have been using people with the disabilities in their films, they should recognize their profound impact on the dignity, identity of the persons with disabilities when they portray the people with disabilities in their films in such a manner. And in fact, Supreme Court has also given the guidelines and these guidelines uh, is a call to avoid words that actually cultivate the institutional discrimination against the persons with disabilities, right? So these guidelines have clearly laid out uh, that these words which actually lead to the institutional discrimination against persons with disabilities, those words should not be used because those words can actually contribute to negative self-image of the people and it could also perpetuate the discriminatory attitudes. So therefore, the filmmakers must refrain from using a such discriminatory words against disability people. And in fact, the Supreme Court guidelines have clearly laid out that a stereotyping differently abled persons or persons with disabilities in films, documentaries, advertisements and visual media. So, the Supreme Court has asked the creators to provide an accurate representation of the disabilities of the people rather than mocking them. So that would lead to the greater sensitization of the people, right? So you have to actually represent what are the problems that the people with disabilities have been facing, right? So that would help in increasing awareness and also sensitizing the larger public about the persons with disabilities and the problems that they have been facing. However, before the comprehensive guidelines laid out by the Supreme Court recently, there were also a number of legislations that were passed by Indian Parliament to protect the rights of persons with disabilities. Now, what are those important laws or legislations? So, one important legislation was, it was a very comprehensive legislation and it deals with the rights of persons with the disabilities. The legislation was Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act. So, that came into force from April 19, And in fact, so this particular legislation has replaced persons with disabilities, equal opportunities, protection of rights and full participation act of 1995. And in fact, there were a number of other laws also such as National Trust Act of 1919, Rehabilitation Council of India Act 1992 and Mental Health Care Act of 2017. So all these uh, laws actually govern the rights of persons with the disabilities. And in fact, so when we talk about the rights of persons with the disabilities, so we can categorize those rights into two broad models. One, uh, you know, uh, you know, namely the medical and the social model. So medical model of rights and the social model of rights. Now, the human rights model is an evolution of the social model. Right? So this particular social model of rights says that people with disability are a part of the society. Like unlike, you know, uh, you know, 
like any other individual in the society the people with disabilities also enjoy a same rights and equal rights along with all other people right so however affirmative action or positive discrimination is provided in favor of the people with the disabilities in india in the form of reservations and supreme court has also emphasized on the human rights model right so it is a significant aspect because it makes the government and the private parties and they are also obligated to facilitate full and effective participation of all the people who are having disabilities however the advantage it places is it places individuals in a sphere where all human rights principles which are applicable to anyone can be claimed by the disabled populace also the disadvantage is it is an abstract idea and it is very often difficult to implement right so supreme court also emphasized on the creative freedom of film makers producers or uh, makers of a movie documentary and even a film uh, cinematic expression doesn't have an absolute power when it operates in the context of marginalized communities now when it has been dealing with the marginalized communities so oh, the supreme court has made it very very clear that it does not have absolute power absolute discretion when it is going to represent these marginalized communities or persons with the disabilities right so it should be subject to the dignity of the individuals or dignity of the persons with the disabilities and in fact the creative freedom of the filmmaker cannot include the freedom to lampoon stereotype misrepresent and disparage those already marginalized however the supreme court has also provided a way forward on this so the way forward should be the court emphasizes on the collaborations with the disability advocacy groups right so there are there are certain civil society groups certain ngos who advocate for the protection of or uh, rights of persons with the disabilities so there should be an active collaboration with such groups to actually gain invaluable insights and guidance on the respectful and accurate portrayal and that could ensure that the content can be aligned with the experiences that people with disabilities have been going through accurate representation of the experiences of people who are going through this situation and also implementing training programs for writers doctors and producers actors that would emphasize the impact of portrayals on public perceptions and the experiences of persons with disabilities is also a necessity so that is how the supreme court has given a guidelines over the protection of rights of persons with the disabilities and that's all in this lecture and thank you so much so uh, please like the video and also subscribe to our youtube channel thank you